It's, uh, it's super exciting for me to be here talking with you all today about the work that I've been spending the past 15 years doing. Um, so what I want to talk to you today about is that work and some questions that I've been asking myself recently. But first, let's play an intuitive game. So imagine you haven't seen the most recent Super Bowl. Can you tell me whether it's likely that this player's team won or lost the game? <laughs> Now, looking at this, I want you to tell me which one of these players most likely won the match and which one of the players most likely lost the match. <laughs> the great Roger Federer, as per usual. Now, here's a sad clip. Um, let me ask you, do you think Roger Federer just won or just lost this match? People do pretty well at this intuitive game across cultures. These are the things that we tacitly know, but you've never actually been directly told. What is it that we actually know? Well, it turns out that we can glean a lot of information from the face. So we can tell which emotion is being felt. So happiness, sadness, disgust, contempt, anger, all have prototypic facial expressions. We can tell if two emotions are blended together. So we can tell the difference between surprise and disgust, like when you see a cockroach, or surprise and happiness when you get a birthday present. And we can also tell the intensity of the emotion. So we can distinguish between a little bit of trepidation to outright terror, or a little bit of annoyance to outright rage all by looking at something as conspicuous as the face. Now, the face is what we call a dual processing system. And what that means is that it's capable of producing both deliberate and spontaneously enervated facial expressions. So what this means is that those of us that study facial expression think that it has something that has more veracity than self-report, we don't believe that smiling flight attendant is actually happy to see us. <laughs> now, the most interesting things to me about facial expressions are the specific limitations that we have in controlling them. And the first line of research comes from neuroscience. And what they found is that spontaneously and deliberately innervated facial expressions emanate from separate upper motor neuron pathways. So deliberately induced facial movements emanate from the cortical motor strip, whereas spontaneous movements emanate from the phylogenetically older extrapyramidal motor system. So what this means is if you've got damage to the cortical motor strip, you'll lose lose the ability to respond uh, and make a facial expression on command, but you'll retain the ability to make one in response to some emotion eliciting stimulus. On the other hand, if you've got damage to the exopyramidal system, the opposite will happen. You'll lose the ability to respond appropriately to some emotion eliciting stimulus, but you'll retain the ability to make a facial expression on command. So what we've got here is a patient who's got a lesion on the right side of his cortical motor strip, um, and he's left hemi-paralyzed. So on the left panel, he's being asked to smile. And you can see that he's only able to recruit the muscles on the anatomic right side of his face because these things are contralaterally wired. But on the right panel, he's shown um, How I Met Your Mother or some uh, other uh, funny TV show that he's able to respond appropriately to. The second line of research comes from Paul Ekman and his group, and he has found that there are specific facial expressions that are more difficult to control than other ones, and he calls these reliable facial muscles. Now, these reliable facial muscles have a specific property, and that is as follows. Fewer than 10 to 15% of individuals can do two things. The first thing is to stop these expressions from happening in the presence of an emotion. And the second thing is to create these expressions in the absence of an emotion. Now, these facial muscles are included in all the basic expressions, including happiness, sadness, anger, and fear. I've got a picture of Woody Allen here because if you were to see this expression on anyone else, your reaction would be like, oh my goodness, what's wrong? But Woody Allen is one of those few individuals that can raise the inner portion of his eyebrow without raising the outer portion of his eyebrow. Very few people can do that. So these two lines of research brought up a very, very interesting question in my mind, and that is, why do we express emotions on our face in the first place? So put another way, what's the benefit of honestly advertising something as subjective and private as your emotional and motivational state, someplace as conspicuous as the face, a place so conspicuous that it can't be inconspicuously hidden. Now, you might imagine that someone might come up with the idea of dissociating their facial expression from their motivational actions. And this person might have an advantage on other individuals because he, he or she could mislead them. And this is what Richard Dawkins and Jonathan Krebs described as an arms race between signalers who try to manipulate receivers and receivers who try to mind, rate, uh, mind read signalers. 
Along the lines of that question is a second question, and that is why did people take expressions at face value? That is, why were you all able to do pretty well at that intuitive game that we played a few minutes ago? Now, we don't know the answer to these questions, um, and because they're very difficult to study, um, but we have some clues from other lines of literature, um, usually from the animal literature, that can give us some hints. So I'm gonna go through each one of those in turn, saving the best for last. So the first reason that facial expressions among humans might be stable is a one-to-one -one coordination of interest between signalers and receivers. And that is to say, if the receiver and the signaler agree 100% on the rank outcomes of the, of the process, then there's no reason for the signaler to lie and no reason for the receiver not to take that signal at face value. Take, for example, this sign, basically saying drive on the left-hand side of the road. People take that signal at face value, why? Because they know that everyone else has just as much at stake as they do in terms of driving on the correct side of the road. Therefore, there's no reason not to take it at face value because there's no reason the signaler would lie. The best example of this in nature is with toxic colored animals. And again, there's a one-to-one -one coordination of interest between predator and prey. The prey don't want to be eaten and the predators don't want to get sick. Now this remains stable despite some animals exploiting the signaling system through Batesian mimicry. Now it's unlikely that this is going to result in the stability of facial expressions in humans simply because there's very rarely a one-to-one -one coordination of interest between any individual. Here you have a, a bird and his or her chicks that needs to be fed. A huge overlap in a relatedness. But here you see an example of something that's rife with deception. From the, from the mother bird's perspective, she wants, equal, she wants equal amounts of food given to her children. But for each children, they want more than their fair share. So what you're seeing here are exaggerated signals from each one of the children. An example of deception here. The second reason that facial expressions might remain reliable is through what Ahmad Sahavi called the handicap principle. And he surmised that if there were associated costs with signals, then the processes could remain stable. The idea is that a signal cannot be faked because only those that could afford to pay for the signal can present it. The best natural example is bowerbirds. Male bowerbirds spend a lot of time and resources making the most elaborate and colorful nests that they can. Now, only those bowerbirds that have the resources to produce those nests can. Thus, the female bowerbirds see it as very, very attractive and very, very sexy and are more likely to mate with the men that have the largest and most intricate nests. Now, this is unlikely, again, to be the cause of stability for facial expressions in humans simply because the cost of a facial expression is very, very minuscule in terms of anatomic resources. One counterexample might be crying. So William Provine has surmised that tears diffuse light, making it more difficult to attack and defend oneself from attacks. And for that reason, they can be an honest signal of appeasement or submission. The third mechanism is called an index. Um, and an index guarantees the reliability of a signaling system because of physiological or anatomical constraints. And the best example here is with animals that display weapons. So the formidability of this fiddler crab's claw is directly related to its size. It can't fake that size. The size is anatomically constrained and thus the formidability is anatomically constrained. Now, this is unlikely to be the, ca the case for facial expressions as well, because as we've seen, there are channels for the voluntary control of facial expressions. And because of this, evolution could have, would have, should have made them all voluntary, but it did not. The fourth mechanism is based off of reputation, and it's called individually directed skepticism. And it basically goes like this. If you lie to someone with your signal, you forever lost their trust, and that is a huge cost. This mechanism is going to result in stability any time the costs of losing someone's trust are going to be outweighed by the benefits of duping someone in initial time. And the best example here is not in nature, it's in the Aesop fable of the boy who cried wolf. And the boy who cried wolf paid a hefty price for his dishonesty. What I wanna to talk to you about now is the one that we've got some empirical evidence for. And this is the idea of emotional commitments. Adam Smith stated that there are certain emotions that function as moral sentiments. And these emotions 
function by competing with calculations that stem from rational self-interest. So take, for example, someone who's capable of strong guilt feelings. This person's not going to cheat on their spouse, not because they're afraid of getting caught, but because they don't want to. Because any gain that they could get from cheating on their spouse is going to be outweighed by those guilt feelings that they're going to feel. Now take, for example, someone who's capable of strong feelings of anger and, and capable of vengeance. This person doesn't need a formal contract to seek revenge. They're going to seek revenge because they want to, because the taste of revenge is going to outweigh any potential cost that they have of getting caught or having some legal sanctions. In this way, emotions serve as commitments that are internal. Most other commitments have some ostensive clue that people can see. And that's why I have a picture here of a burning bridge. A burning bridge is a signal to your adversaries that your battalion has no intention to retreat. And it's a signal to your battalion that they better get their resolve in order. Now, the problem with this is as follows. The good feeling that we get from not cheating on our spouses and the good feelings that we get from exacting revenge on those people that dealt with us unjustly are, in a very real sense, their own rewards. But we are living in a material world, a world with material payoffs. And for these sentiments to be viable, that is, for them to have evolved via evolution by natural selection, they must have garnered some sort of material payoff. That's to say there's, the whole point of a predilection to feel guilty is to get people to cooperate with you in the first place. There's no point in proving to someone now that you would have been a good cooperative partner then. Same thing with, uh, with the propensity to seek revenge. There's no point in proving to someone now that you should not have harmed me then. It's too late. In order for these subjective commitments to have any utility, they must be guaranteed to other individuals beforehand. How might we guarantee those subjective commitments? This is a cartoon from The New Yorker. Here we have a couple that needs to decide whether they want to buy some pencils from a salesman. If they believe this salesman to be rational, the whip doesn't matter. There's no way that a rational person would risk any legal sanctions for an added pencil sale or two. But if they believe this man to be irrational, then the whip all of a sudden means a whole hell of a lot. And it's in their self-interest to buy a pencil whether they want to or not. <laughs> now, the important thing here is that it's not the sign around his neck that lets you know that he's irrational. Why? Because that could be easily fabricated, just like our words can be. It's the look on his face, the look that he had limited control over, that lets him know that he's irrational. Now, here we see the material benefits. Now, he's a deterrent. The idea here is that our emotions are subjective commitments that are internal and unobservable. And our facial expressions are intimately tied to them so that other people know what we're capable of. This leads to a specific hypothesis, that facial expressions should increase the credibility of verbal threats and promises. Now, we tested this using a game, an economic game called the ultimatum game. In the ultimatum game, you've got two players, a proposer and a responder. The proposer is given some sum of money from an experimenter, usually $10 or so, and given the task of dividing this money between him or herself and the responder. At this point, the responder can either accept what the proposer delineated, in which case both individuals get what the proposer proposed, or the responder can reject the offer, in which case both people get nothing. So this is a spiteful action. Now, if we assume that both of these players are obeying the rules of rational self-interest, we would expect a responder to take the lowest denomination that the proposer gives to him or her, even if it's one cent, because one cent is greater than nothing. And we would expect, by that same logic, a proposer to offer the lowest denomination possible. What typically happens? Typically, proposers offer 50-50 splits, and responders reject offers less than 33%. And we don't know why, but we surmise that it's because the specter of rejection increases proposer offers. So here's what we did. We showed proposers videos of Confederate responders with verbal threats. On the right-hand side, you see an angry facial expression. On the right-hand side, you see a neutral expression. This was paired with the statement, I will reject your offer if you, less, if you offer me less than 50% of the pot. The second set of responders had the same facial expressions, again, left, we have a neutral expression, on the right, we have an anger expression, but this time it was, po it was posed with a different verbal threat, and this threat was, if you offer me less than 70% of the pot, I will reject your offer. Now, this difference isn't trivial. 
To say to someone, I will reject less than 70% of the pot, that takes an additional emotional guarantor. What we hypothesize is that with a neutral expression, the proposers would blow that off. But with an anger expression, the proposer would say, okay, this person's capable of something. I better give them what they want. So what did we find? Here's a graph of the results. On the left-hand side, you can see the 50 cent threats on the neutral uh, expressions of the solid line with the diamond, the anger expressions of the dashed line with the, with the square. Um, when the threat was for 50 cents, the facial expression didn't make a difference. The 50 cent threat is credible. It doesn't need an, an additional emotional guarantor. But when you say, I will reject anything less than 70% of the pot, if you say that with a neutral expression, people blow it off. They don't believe you. But if you say it with an anger expression, then the proposer is like, all right, I I'm going to make some concessions here. So what does this mean? This means that our emotions and our facial expressions are valuable tools in any negotiation strategy. Not only do they bridge us together, but they can keep us apart. Keep this in mind anytime you buy a house, anytime you buy a car, anything that you're negotiating with at all, this is what allows us to be successful in negotiations. Thank you very much.